Well, I came across something recently and it turned out to be a whole civilization. And the civilization needed a name and I decided to call it the Luvian civilization. And the talk today will be about this civilization. Um, it existed and thrived in Western Asia Minor, that is the western side of modern Turkey. And it had major impact on the earliest civilizations on European soil. So I would like to give you a short overview of the contents of my talk. We are talking about Western Asia Minor. I may call it Anatolia, I may call it Turkey. It's essentially the same. Um, the talk is structured into four subjects. The first one is to introduce the field of investigating the civilizations that existed at the time. Um, it's called the Aegean Bronze Age. The period we are interested in is the second millennium BC. So that's the time from 2000 BCE before the Common Era to 1000 before the Common Era. The Trojan War occurred around 1200 uh, BCE. So it's essentially we are talking about the time of the Trojan War. The second subject is the quest for the Luvian civilizations, what we did to find them. Um, first of all, to find the settlements and the settlement patterns. We will look at uh, some of the archaeological sites. Uh, we will also look at the economy, at ore deposits, at trade routes, um, at the political organization just very slightly. And then I want to show you some of the characteristics of this civilization, because we do already know uh, uh, quite a bit about it through chance finds. And eventually the question is what are the potential implications and it turns out that it, uh, the Sluvian civilization may shed some light on the famous Sea People invasions. I will tell you what this is, the Trojan War, the shape of the city of Troy and uh, uh, it will also help for future historic inquiries in general I think. Uh, let's start with the first subject, and that is the Aegean Bronze Age. As I said, the Bronze Age stops around 1200 BC. It starts around 3000 BC, so it's the third and the second millennium BCE before the Common Era. A design flaw, ein Konstruktionsfehler auf Deutsch. Um, that's a bold thing to say for a discipline. But I hope I can convince you that there is something really fundamentally wrong in the way Aegean prehistory was formulated when it was conceived about 100 years ago. Now if we go back in time, let's say to the middle of the 19th century, so we are at around 1850, how did people back then, historians, archaeologists, view the past? Well, we are here today, PCs, uh, go back to the printing press, the Quran, Caesar, birth of Christ, and then eventually history, European history, stopped or began uh, with uh, the introduction of writing in Greece in the 8th century, with the first Olympic Games in 776 BCE, uh, and before that there was a dark age and we didn't know anything about the cultures before then. Of course archaeologists always knew that there are very ancient civilizations in Egypt and in Mesopotamia, but here we are looking at the Aegean, at Greece and Asia Minor, and there everything was lost in the dark before 800 BC. And then somebody came along by the name of Heinrich Schliemann, a very wealthy uh, merchant who didn't really know what to do with his life and looked for a new purpose and heard by chance that under this or in this mount he could find the Homeric Troy. This is the mount called Hizalik in northwestern Turkey. Where Schliemann then excavated started in, starting in 1870 and you can see the effects of his excavations. Um, this is from 1880. At that time already there is not much left of the mound. You can just see the, the, the uh, foundation of it, so to say. Uh, everything else has been removed. Schliemann got really famous because he made a major discovery. He found treasures, he found a big royal citadel, and all of this was wrong for a number of reasons. 
in particular because it was 1,000 years older than classical Greece, so it was way beyond the Dark Age, 1,000 years older than classical Greece, and uh, it was on the wrong side of the Aegean. It was uh, in Asia Minor, whereas thus far um, archaeological inquiries, if there were any, concentrated on, on Greece. He then continued and excavated um, already known site Mycenae um, on the Greek mainland and uh, some other sites as well. And others followed suit in his approach. And in 1900, Arthur Evans excavated Knossos. And in 1907, uh, Germans started excavations in Hattusha, the uh, capital of the Hittite Empire in Central Asia Minor. So within 40 years, a number of civilizations were discovered that were so much older than antiquity. And this new knowledge had to be structured in some way, because there was no structure to accommodate it to begin with. And there were, of course, a number of people who contributed to the new structure. But the most important one was certainly Arthur Evans, the man in the white suit here excavating and reconstructing, uh, partly reconstructing, the palace in Knossos. Evans' ex uh, publications appeared from 1920 onwards for the next 10 years. And in these publications, he provided the foundations for Aegean prehistory or the Aegean Bronze Age. And at that time, uh, 1920, there was a major war between Turkey and Greece. And Evans was, of, of course, a Philhellene, a lover of Greece. Um, but he was also somewhat um, a racist, as you can see. So he was not really interested in emphasizing any civilizations on Turkish territory. So he was dealing basically with these four major well, capitals or major sites. And uh, when he introduced uh, the structure for Aegean prehistory, it looked somewhat like this. He introduced three cultures, the Mycenaean culture, the Minoan culture, and the Cycladic culture. He defined them, uh, but those civilizations did not really coincide with the major sites. For instance, Troy was completely neglected, even though it was found first and it was by far the most famous of the sites. And uh, the reason for that was most likely um, that these three civilizations fall on European soil, whereas Tur Troy is in Turkey. So the effect of this, and this was probably very well intended, was that uh, no scholarly attention would be directed to Anatolia. Of course, then later, the Hittite civilization was added to the picture. But we have a very big gap in between the Hittites and in between the already well-known uh, Aegean civilizations. And this gap is filled by the Luvians now, hopefully. Um, now, 100 years have passed since then, and today's archaeologists have a very different attitude and do not have this bias anymore. But at the same time, they have never really questioned the, the foundations of their discipline. So over the past few years, we had a number of very substantial books um, appearing on Aegean Bronze Age. These four books together consist of maybe 3,000 pages. And you will not find very more than 10 pages or so on Western Asia Minor in all four of them combined. What Evans has conceived 100 years ago lasted and had an effect. And we can see this effect. For instance, if we look at the textbook of the Aegean Bronze Age, the distribution of Middle Bronze Age sites, and you can see they are all on European territory. The, the ones that existed in Asia Minor are not even accounted for. So this is one picture that we are getting. We also have a very different picture. If we look at uh, the places where the Greek philosophers, mathematicians, uh, poets, astronomers, astronomers, physicians, and so came from, the vast majority of them before Socrates came from Asia Minor. And there must be a reason for that. And uh, I think that there was a substrate uh, of a civilization that these people benefited from. 
So this is the design flaw in a gene prehistory, as I call it. And what we are trying now to do is to compensate for it. I think it uh, provides huge opportunities, actually, for our and future generations for research. So the second part of my talk is the quest for the Luvians. How do we fill this gap? How does one recognize a Bronze Age site if you come across one? How about that? I, th I would say if you find something like that, you are pretty close. No? Um, this is, um, of course, reconstructed. It is reconstructed in the way citadel walls, fortification walls, were built over 3,000 years ago. This is the outer fortress wall of Hattusha, uh, the Hittite capital in Central Asia Minor. It was reconstructed using the same building technique that was used by the Hittites. So you have a um, foundation of natural rocks, and then you have mud brick on top of that. What would that look like 3,000 years later? How much of it would be preserved? I argue absolutely nothing. The, the mud brick is dissolved, and the people remove the natural stones and use them for building stones elsewhere. And then it's very difficult to argue that there was a major site and there's nothing left. That's uh, part of our problem is um, during the past 3,000 years, everything that was in an elevated place is eroded, like, like Troy. We are now 10 meters below the Bronze Age surface. The Bronze Age surface was way in the air. Everything that is in lower elevations is buried. So we do not have the pre prehistoric surface in place anywhere. And you need a lot of experience and scientific methods to extrapolate what the landscape looked like and to come up with educated guesses on how to find out more about uh, the settlement pattern. The scale in this picture is 1.87 meters. Uh, this is just to show you how wide the roads are in, in Hattusha. In this uh, site is so big you need a car to drive through it and it takes you all day. It's really very, very large. And uh, the archaeologists who have been excavating there, they found uh, 33,000 documents from the Hittite era. And they gave us a lot of information about the topography, the politics or so. Um, and uh, they were written in, for the most part, in Akkadic cuneiform, um, but in different languages. The same, the same script, but different languages. And one of the languages was Luvian. So that's where the name comes from, from this language. The Hittites actually called them Luvians. But the Luvians did not have just this one script. They also had their own script, which was a hieroglyphic script, very picturesque, um, and used for a very long time, a thousand years. Actually, the Luvians had this 300 years before the Greeks introduced Linear B at their palaces, Mycenae and Tiryns and so on. For 300 years, they had the knowledge of writing and could therefore structure their economy or so and did not pass it on to their neighbors. And when the Bronze Age collapsed, the Luvians kept this uh, hieroglyphic writing for another 500 years, whereas all the others lost theirs. So we want to find places like that. And how, we do, we, how do we do that? By Digging, of course. Archaeologists make excavations, and that's probably the best way of finding out about the past. But I'm a geologist. I'm a geologist trained to work on archaeological excavations and surveys to reconstruct the landscape and to say what it looked like um, thousands of years ago. Geologists have very quite similar methods to archaeologists because we look at the stratigraphy and we reconstruct the past. But geologists are trained to think in larger time scales and also in larger geographic scales. So we like to take a step back. If you ever have the feeling in your research that you are too close to something, take a step back. Yeah? And that's what we do when we take a step back and look at it from a distance. Western Asia Minor from a distance. And I'm not kidding. We actually benefit very much in archaeology by using technologies in outer space. In February 2000, um, <coughs> the uh, space shuttle carried the biggest um, load that it ever had. It was a radar 
telescope, so to say, the Shuttle Radar Topography Mission. Uh, and the um, purpose of this mission was to produce a high-resolution digital elevation model of the surface of the Earth, continuous. Because until then, we just had maps, and they have big discrepancies from one country to another. So we got a continuous elevation model of the surface of the Earth. This is available now, and we can make the most out of it. This is the area we are interested in, the eastern uh, Mediterranean. All this information is digital, so we can manipulate it. We can actually uh, use it, ex exploit it. And the first thing we do is add some color to get, in addition to the relief, a topography. And we ended up using the colors of our old school atlases, because the people who produced them, they really had so much experience um, that it turns out that this is still the, the best way to visualize the information. It is, in a way, the most modern data shown in a very traditional format. Um, the area that we are mostly interested in is Western Asia Minor. Here's Antalya. We, we draw a north-south line through Antalya. Uh, over to the left is, are the Mycenaeans. They have been investigated very well. Over to the right are the Hittites. They also have been studied very well. So we are interested in this area. That's why I would like to concentrate on that. We have taken down the relief a bit and we have also reduced the topography a bit because I'm adding now um, different layers of information onto the topography. There are a number of archaeological sites in this area. If you have ever visited them, uh, visited <coughs> this area, you are very likely to have visited the uh, sites as well. For instance, Ephesus, Miletus, uh, Pergamon and, and, and so on. Um, so there's a lot of archaeological research going on. But Almost all of it is concentrating on the time after 800 BCE, um, so that is the historic periods when this area has been colonized by, by Greeks. And what we are interested in is a thousand years older than that, so to say. Um, and also, but uh, even from those periods, from the Bronze Age, there are 2,000 known sites in this area. And all we did is we looked at them individually, it took two years to determine which ones were inhabited during the late Bronze Age. And we found 340. So in one snap, we essentially have what we now call the Luvian civilization. What used to be a white spot on the map is now covered with 340 dots. In addition, we have um, recorded all the ore deposits in this area that were interesting during the Bronze Age. Gold, silver, copper, lead. And it turns out that the area has been very, is, is very rich in uh, mineral deposits. And this may also be the reason why very rich kings live there. For instance, Midas, in whose hands everything turned into gold. He lived up in Gordion. Um, Croesus, the, the richest man on earth, he lived in uh, Sardis. Yeah. Um, so, even the Greeks knew about the legendary wealth of the kings who ruled in this area. We've also traced the trade routes and the, the settlement pattern that seemed to be uneven to begin with makes more sense when we add all this information. Um, we have taken out the topography and introduced the alluvial plains and it turns out that uh, the sites are associated with the alluvial plains of the rivers. The people go to places where they have plenty of water, where they have arable land, uh, where they are close to trade routes, and where they have some uh, mineral resources in the, in the back country. If you, if you would exploit North America before it was settled, this is exactly what we would do. We go to the places that are most convenient and economically most promising. This is what the people did. Areas in between that had nothing really to offer were completely left untouched. They were used maybe for uh, taking timber out or so, and it was probably also inhabited by, by dangerous animals. The Hittites in their many thousand documents mention the names of their neighbors. They mention 2,000 town names and uh, a few dozen uh, names of uh, states. And there's a lot of discussion going on amongst archaeologists where to place those names. 
but it's less controversial now than it used to be and people are basically zeroing in on these locations. So now we have a politically and economic map um, of Western Asia Minor, um, an area that used to be a white spot on the map. Actually, um, Sonderforschungsbereich is a, a, a term that everybody in this room knows. It's a focal point of research in Germany, um, the biggest. Actually, there was a uh, Sonderforschungsbereich for 25 years, uh, Tübinger Atlas des Vorderen Orients, to establish a number of maps of settlement distribution and geographic properties. And they certainly had on their to-do list to produce one for the second millennium BC, and it, it was never produced. This is actually today the first time that we can show this. <coughs> now, what do those archaeological sites look like today? This is one of them. This is Shahuyuk. Uh, it's 450 meters by 450 meters. The whole pile consists of uh, human debris. The people made, uh, produced houses out of uh, mud bricks and they lasted for one or two generations and then they um, collapsed and when they collapsed the people just leveled the ground and built the next mud brick house on top of it. And this is why they accumulated layer on layer. This is 15 meters tall. So they're very well confined, very large. They don't always, they are not always that large. This one is Bay Koi. As you can see, also very well confined. I like this uh, in particular because the farmers found um, tablets with writing in their, in their fields here. So if one would excavate this site, it would be very promising to find more, more documents and therefore find out more about the people who lived there. This may have well been the seat of a king at the end of the Bronze Age and, and even in the early Iron Age, an important site. Because the sites are so well confined, you can actually see them from the air. Yeah? We call them uh, tells in English, Höyük um, or Hüyük in Turkish, and Magula in Greece. Um, so these are the piles up from uh, in aerial photographs, vertical aerial photographs. This one is sitting right uh, on a lake shore. Chanda Höyük here, you can see they're always associated with rivers and uh, arable land. Guanche, Tolchak, I could go on and I will. <laughs> Most of them are unexcavated, completely unstudied. It's very difficult to excavate such a place in a short time because the Bronze Age layers are 5 meters, 10 meters below the surface and you have to go through the medieval material and the Roman and the Hellenistic and the classical um, until you eventually get to the Bronze Age. Carapazar. This one is 500 meters big. We, there's some aesthetic beauty to this. Uh, we turned them into a calendar and passed it out to archaeologists in, in Turkey, our colleagues. Uh, many, many places to be excavated. Colossi. This is one I like also very much. It shape, has the shape of a bean. Uh, it's 300 by 400 meters large. And the uh, peculiar thing about this one is, the remarkable thing is, it was populated until 1200 BC and then not anymore. So if we would excavate there, we would have the Bronze Age, Late Bronze Age material right at the surface. The other thing that is really remarkable about these sites in Western Asia Minor is that they are extremely rich in artifacts. This is a freshly uh, plowed field in Chandala, uh, and you can see that the soil essentially consists of ceramics. And the stones that are in between were most certainly used as uh, building stone, the filling between the outer and the inner wall. Now, not all of this is Bronze Age, of course, because this place has been inhabited for 4,000 years, so it goes through all the periods. And if you look at these all together, we now have a settlement pattern for Western Asia Minor, where there was essentially nothing before, at least certainly nothing systematic. 
And if we expand our view again to look at the whole Eastern Mediterranean, these are the sites that we have recorded recently, the Luvian sites, so to say. These are the Mycenaean sites that have been well known. They are much denser, not just because the Mycenaeans have been investigated for 130 years or so, but also because we haven't really filtered those sites. There are some that are not equivalent to the Luvian sites. The Luvian sites, we only took major settlement sites, and these might be individual graves or so. The Minoan sites on Crete, sites on Cyprus. There are now sites over here, well, there are sites over there, about 60 Hittite sites, but we are, this is still work in progress. This is what we are working on right now. And again, we can add the mineral deposits, and it turns out that the Troad, where Troy is, was really rich in minerals. This area where later King Croesus lived was very rich in gold. And northern Greece was very rich in a number of minerals. Greece itself didn't have a whole lot, and neither did the Hittite core area. The trade routes, again, work in progress, but there are two trade routes, and this has been long for, uh, known for a long time, um, overland routes that lead all the way to Babylonia. And if we take out the topography and look at the uh, alluvial plains, which are now much smaller, uh, it's still very visible that uh, the sites are associated with the arable land. Again, this area we haven't really looked at, and it's not as fertile as it looks. <coughs> and also, because there are lakes, there was always a risk of malaria. But there's a lot more to be, f to be found in this data. If you look at them more closely, it turns out that the distance along the trade routes um, between two major sites was about 35 kilometers. There's an equal spacing between them, 35 kilometers. And that seems to be the distance people walked in one day if they still had to walk the, day, the next day and the day after. You can walk more than 35 kilometers, but you will have a hard time the next day. If you walk every day, 35 kilometers turns out to be just about the maximum. Now, sometimes the distance is much bigger, and we can now argue that obviously there are sites missing in between that have not been found. They are missing because they are eroded, uh, or they are missing because they've been overbuilt. There's a modern town on top of it. There's other things. We can um, attribute 24 different physical parameters to each of these sites because it's digital data. For instance, terrain height. Uh, inclination or roughness, and we can plot this on a relative scale against each other. For instance, plot terrain height against terrain inclination, and we end up in, in this square. Uh, for the 340 sites, those are the red dots, and we put in another 340 randomly distributed uh, sites for which we established the same data, and those are the gray dots. So you can see the gray dots are randomly distributed, but the red dots are all either at an elevation close to the coast or a few hundred meters up because they are on the, on the levels in Anatolia. And they are all in very flat, on very flat surface, all over to the left. So this is the kind of analysis we can now conduct. We can even come to the point where we have a mathematical index between 1 and 10, how suitable for a settlement a location was just on its physical parameters. Um, a little over ten, 20 years ago, I introduced this map uh, where I showed in a very, very schematic way what we know about the late Bronze Age civilizations in around the Eastern Mediterranean, that essentially all the areas were covered except for this one, which didn't make sense because this area is so rich uh, in arable land, indicated here in green, but also in ore deposits, and was rich in the early Iron Age, as we all know. So we can fill this gap now and say that this is where the Luvians lived. Archaeologists have, of course, known about this gap, and they have looked for ways to fill it, and so they came up with a political map of the Hittite Empire that expanded further and further to the west until it touched the Mycenaean kingdoms. So, in order to fill the gap, they expanded the Hittite and the Mycenaean kingdoms. Um, I think this situation may have existed.
for a very short time, if at all. But it was certainly based on vassals. The, there were petty kingdoms here in the Deluvian territories. Um, they did not really belong to the Hittite uh, civilization. They were just bound by contract to deliver taxes and soldiers if they were needed. And if the Luvians didn't want to be vassals anymore, they could have formed a coalition and uh, fight the great king of Hattusha, and apparently this is exactly what they did. I think the great king of Hatti would have been overjoyed if this was really the political situation at the end of the Bronze Age. The Hittites might still be ruling today. There must be a reason why they were knocked out, and uh, so we should not stretch this model too far. If we look at the language distribution, and this is from a reference volume that recently appeared, it looks like this. Much of Anatolia, in much of Anatolia, Alluvian was spoken as a language, and Hittite as a language was actually limited to the core of central Anatolia. And even there, uh, it was spoken mostly by the upper echelons of the society. Apparently, there was a high and a low language. The low language for the average people was Luvian for the most part, and the kings and aristocrats and administrators, they spoke Hittite. So here they are, and what do they look like, and what are their char characteristics? I told you we found 340 sites. And for Mycenae, we now have 300, but we will have to reduce this number uh, when we have filtered the sites. My known is 34, the Hittites approximately 60. So we have as many Luvian sites as we have of all the other three major civilizations combined. And that is on day one of research starting um, investigations of the Luvians. By the way, we are, have illustrated these uh, major numbers now with pictures of the people that lived back then. We have a very clear image of them from uh, Egyptian temple inscriptions and Egyptian ceramics. And this is a teka, this is a typical Luvian. There are many different um, tribes and kingdoms. They had different dresses and weapons and headdresses. Um, and um, teka, we see, we'll see that per person a couple of times later on, um, could be interpreted as Trojans because the Trojans were also called Toika um, in the early Iron Age. The Luvian territory expanded over 250,000 square kilometers. And so again, it is as big as the other three civilizations together. The Luvian script was found in 1812 and therefore two to three generations before Linear B, Linear A and uh, Akkadic Cunic form in, in Hattusha. So we have known about this script for two to three generations before we knew about the other scripts. The Luvian script was in use for a full 1,000 years. The Mycenaean Linear B script for 250, Minoan for 350, and in Hattusha during the administration there, the period uh, roughly 500 years. So they had this script long before the other scripts were available, and they kept it on after the others lost their writing. The Greeks lost their knowledge of writing completely. The Luvians were trading, apparently, metals, horses, timber, um, perishable products that are not so easy to trace. We know the trade commodities uh, best from uh, shipwrecks. And the Luvians never experienced a demise. As opposed to the Hittites, who had a very sudden demise around 1190 BCE, um, the Minoans, who were taken over by the Mycenaeans at one point, and the Mycenaeans themselves perished over one or two generations during the 12th and 11th century. And the Luvians went on for another um, 500 years after that. And research into the Luvians um, has not even started. This is basically day number one, whereas the others are more than, um, have been investigated for more than 100 years. So we have to catch up there quite a bit. Now finally, the question is, what is this good for? So what can we do with this? And therefore, I would like to show you some of the um, implications and maybe applications um, of these findings. Spoke about the Eastern Mediterranean. At around 1200 BC, there was a major civilization collapse. The Hittite 
civilization disappeared more or less overnight. Uh, many, many sites were destroyed. Um, and this is usually attrib attributed to the infamous Sea People invasions, people who attacked first Cyprus, we know that from documents and from the archaeological record, then Syria, and then pushed on um, against the Hittites coming from the south. And there are Egyptian temple in inscriptions that show what was going on. You see here the Sea People with the um, feather crown headdress. Oh, you see here the guy with the two horned Helms, Sardin, Sheridan. And you see the Egyptians, of course, successfully fighting those attacks. The conflict that occurred at the time has all the uh, attributes of um, commercial war, <coughs> an economic war like we would have it today. And since people didn't have money back in those days, um, essentially the access to ore deposits was what they were interested in. And if you look at the access to ore deposits, it's basically over here. It's not with the Mycenaean Greeks, and it's not with the Hittites. The Hittites had copper ores over in the east, but they were taken away from Assyrians, and so the Hittite king had to compensate for that, and he attacked Cyprus. Uh, Cyprus, the name already implies it is very rich in copper, but that was, may have been one step too many because Cyprus is really important also as a stepping stone for the, for the marine trade. And uh, apparently at that point, the Luvian petty kingdoms who existed over here decided to form a coalition and uh, conquer, reconquer Cyprus. And for that they needed ships, so they not only formed a coalition, they also built a fleet and went on from their territories over here and went to Cyprus and from there on to Syria and to attack the Hittite king. And they were supported by attacks from the north who went to the Hittite capital. When they arrived there, um, it was already empty. The people who lived there had escaped because they knew the danger that was coming. And apparently within a very short period of time, the Hittite ruling class, the army, the king was wiped out and with it the whole Hittite civilization and was forgotten for over 3,000 years until in 1907 excavations started again. So with no, by knowing about this area, by knowing about the Luvians, we are able for the first time to present a plausible solution to the Sea People invasions. Something that those four books I showed you with the 3,000 pages were not able to do. The next item that we could explain with, when we take the Luvians into account is the Trojan War. You see a Greek warrior here chasing a feather crown warrior. If you look even at, at Homer and his description of the Trojan War, it's, it's not just happening at Troy. First of all, the kingdom of Troy, Troy itself being here, was quite large when it was really blossoming. And uh, secondly, the Greeks did not just attack Troy. All these red cities were wiped out just by Achilles. Yeah? So it was a major military operation. And just the final battle of it um, happened at Troy. If we take the Luvians into account, it turns out, and we know this from Homer, he describes not just the Greek forces one by one, he also provides a contingent a catalog of the Trojan contingents and the Trojans and their allies. And it's uh, really the same of what we know about the neighbors of the Hittites to the west and, and what we now know about the Sea People. So it's always the same thing. It's just part that, that part has not been included in our knowledge. Actually, there are hundreds of books on uh, the catalog of ships of the Greek forces in the Trojan War. What the Greeks did is they they were facing um, a Luvian, after the Luvians had kicked out the Hittites, they were facing an enemy what, which was controlling this whole area up until Syria and Palestine. And uh, even though they may not have been attacked by themselves, they decided that this power would be overwhelming in the long run. And therefore they copied their approach. They formed a coalition amongst many petty kingdoms and uh, they built a fleet, it took them a few years, and then they attacked the Luvians, not just uh, Troy, but 
their port cities and destroyed them one by one. So that's the second implication. We have a plausible explanation for the Trojan War. The third explanation regards the city of Troy itself, and I've been talking about this here um, before. The city of Troy is located at the entrance to the Dardanelles, essentially the passageway to the Black Sea. But because of the strong current that is flowing out of the Sea of Marmara in the Dardanelles, the ships could not easily sail in there. They had to make a 50-kilometer detour around this island and um, turn in there. And uh, there I reconstructed a um, hypothetical uh, water engineering system where it would have been possible to avoid this detour by carrying the ships over land a few hundred meters at Troy and then dragging them into a freshwater port and from there they can pick up a counter current that takes them like an escalator up the Dardanelles. And this dry slipway, of course, I would never um, hypothetically reconstruct if there are not traces, very major traces of it in the landscape. This is the coast towards the Aegean. There's a 30 to 60 meter high cliff here. And in this cliff you have this artificial cut that is 500 meters long and leads to a basin that is now silted up that uh, would have been an artificial port. But in addition to that, we are now for the first time able to draw a cross-section, not just through the royal citadel of Troy that has been excavated for over 140 years, but also connected with the alluvial deposits in the plain of Troy. And this is very well known. We, the, the Troy of the Bronze Age, um, the late Bronze Age, is the red layer. So it's up in the sky here. We are many meters below the Bronze Age surface. There's nothing to be found there, in other words, anymore, because it's all either eroded or leveled or um, removed by archaeologists. But the actual city of Troy was not on the Knoll. This was just the royal citadel. The actual city was in the floodplain, and it has been found there in drill cores five to six meters below the present surface. It's buried underground, and we can say to 10 meters where to dig to find ancient Troy in 5.1 meter depth. And uh, based on such information, uh, we can reconstruct what Troy looks like. Um, but it's not just this information, what it looked like. Um, there are also other accounts that helped us in this uh, pursuit. So you have the Dardanelles here, the water flowing out of it, and the Aegean coast here. Um, you have the Royal Citadel isolated on a knoll. This is the place where archaeologists have been excavating 140 years. There's no lower town around the Royal Citadel. There's a um, palace garden around it. Nothing to be found within 500 meters around the citadel. The actual city is limited to the area of the floodplain, had its own fortification walls, uh, and it was destroyed by the Greeks, but it's ruined, are buried by the flash floods of the river. You can see here that the city is topographically below the rivers. It's like New Orleans. If something happens, a war or so, uh, people are not controlling the hydrology anymore, the whole city will be flooded by the rivers and by the sediments and buried. This is exactly what happened, and we have about a dozen accounts describing it. One of the best accounts is Guido de Columnus from 1287, a book in Latin that describes the, the Trojan War, and in particular the city of Troy in all its details. Um, I found this by accident about a year ago. This is a German translation from 1450. This book has been translated nine times into German. The last time was in 1599. It was the most successful book, apart from the Bible, in the history of uh, European civilization. And now not even medievalists know it anymore, because it has been forgotten over the past few hundred years, because everybody is paying attention to Homer only. This is, by the way, is the first page of a manuscript from 1450, which was illustrated with 300 pictures, and it shows the author. Guido de Columnus gives us a description of Troy like that. He mentions the cut through the coastal ridge, and he also says that one of the uh, most impressive characteristics is that there were canals that were built over, so there were subterraneous canals, but 
and nevertheless navigable. So they could sh ships could go underground from the ports to the royal palace. So this is the third, and, uh, the third implication, reconstructing the city of Troy um, to stimulate research in the floodplain, essentially. And the fourth and final, and these are the last two slides I have, is historic inquiries in general. Um, this is a time arrow. It starts 1182 um, BCE with the Trojan War and continues to the beginning of the Common Era and the next half, the next picture will show the upper half of it. Um, and it shows the people who argued in a pro-Trojan way on the right side in red and those who argued on a pro-Greek way on the left side in blue. And you see here, it started out, there was a lot of enthusiasm for Troy. Uh, the Romans derived themselves from Trojan ancestors. Um, and not just the Romans, then the Franks, the Germans, also essentially in medieval times, and we are now in the medieval 500, 1000, um, 2015 here. In medieval times, the topic of Troy was really extremely popular. Essentially, at one point, all the European uh, people derived themselves from Troy, even the Polish and Iceland and, and so on. Um, it was extremely popular during the medieval time. And uh, Guido de Columnis, 1287, as I said, was the best-selling book in the history of Europe. It really took off. The first printed book in English uh, was the, the story of Troy, uh, John Lydgate, the Troy book. It's a translation of Guido de Columnus. Um, but this whole enthusiasm changed in 1453 when the Ottomans uh, conquered Constantinople. There were a lot of uh, scholars who lived in Constantinople and they escaped from the city and went to Italy and of course had an anti-Ottoman approach. And uh, it had changed completely when Vienna was besieged in 1683. After that, scholars sat down and said, we need a completely new view of the past. We need a role model for modern Europe. And they found this role model in Greek antiquity. And since then, we have had, a, well, it's called here Philhellenic, or I'd say a, a pro-Greek approach to the past. But this is only at most half of the picture, if we really want to understand what was going on, we have to take these things into account as well. And so now we have a reason to go back to all to the, these sources, look at each of these centuries one by one, and think uh, whether we have to recapitulate or reconsider our historic research uh, in, in those um, areas. So with this, um, I would like to thank the growing team at Luvian Studies in Zurich. Lubin Studies is a foundation founded last year, as Joachim said. Um, if you are interested in our research, I'll invite you to visit our website and um, have a look at it. Thank you very much for bearing with me tonight uh, and good night.